While traveling east along the road towards Nipton, we see a firefight breaking out between two people just off the road. As we get close, a woman named Jacqueline asks for our help. Help! You there! Please help me! He's crazy! Please help me! Oh, we have no other context. We don't know why they're fighting. We can allow them to resolve the situation themselves, or we can intervene. After the fight ends, if Jacqueline wins, we see her run over to Thomas's corpse and loot something from off of his body. She then runs up to you. Thank God you came around. That guy was gonna kill me. Now we can respond a number of ways. If we say, don't mention it, I'll be on my way. Stay safe. The road's dangerous in these parts. Or so I hear. She turns around and walks away. Otherwise, we can say, are you all right? I am now. I was just minding my own business heading west when that psycho came out of nowhere and started shooting. He kept shouting about stars or something. Does that make any sense to you? We have three options. If we say, we have no idea. No reason it should, I suppose. I need to be going. Thank you again. She turns around and walks away. But if we have previously found Sunset Sarsaparilla Star bottle caps and we understand their value, we can say yes, he was probably trying to steal some Sunset Sarsaparilla stars from you. Some what? Never mind. I'm going to take a few moments to compose myself then head out. Thank you again. She turns around and walks away. But as soon as we turn our back to her... Sucker! She turns around and opens fire, leaving us one choice to kill her in self-defense. Her reaction is the same if we choose the other option. We can say, do you have any bottle caps with stars on them? Um, uh, no, I don't think so. Caps are caps, right? Look, I think I need a few moments to compose myself, then head out. Once again, thanks. If at any point we admit that we know how valuable the star Sucker. bottle caps are, she turns on us and tries to murder us. Now we had another option here. If we noticed her loot, the corpse of Thomas, we can say, what was it that you took from his corpse? What, this? Uh, he stole this from me at gunpoint. Lucky for me, he got distracted and I got a chance to draw on him. It's a necklace that I made out of these special caps. You ever see any caps with a blue star on them like these? Yes, I have a few myself. Oh, then you know how rare they are. I'm just glad they're back where they belong. You can never be too careful these days. But we've admitted that we know what these are. And so, of course, as soon as we turn our backs, she attacks. The other option is hostility. We can say, yes, I've heard of them, and I'm thinking of adding yours to my collection. This is the only option that garners an honest response from her. You know... I was just thinking the same thing about you. She naturally turns hostile, and we kill her. There's also a seven intelligence check. We can play mind games with her. We can say, yes, I've seen these caps before, but nothing like the six that you just looted off of his corpse. They are nice, aren't they? I'm very proud of them. But of course, we've noticed that the necklace is made out of seven caps, not six, but she didn't notice it, which means that they're not hers. Well, I guess you're just too smart for me. Unfortunately, I can't leave any witnesses behind. She again opens fire, forcing us to kill her. On her corpse are nine Sunset Sarsaparilla star bottle caps. We learn from this speech check that she just looted seven off of Thomas's corpse, which means she must have only had two. But what if Thomas wins the encounter? If we side with him, or if we don't intervene and he wins the gunfight, just like Jacqueline, he comes up to you. Did you see that? That crazy bitch just attacked me out of nowhere. Do you have any idea why, Thomas? No, none at all. We've been traveling together since I picked her up a few days ago, and she's been friendly this whole time. We'd actually been flirting a little when she suddenly pulled a gun out and began yelling at me to hand my caps over. Now that I think of it, though, she laughed when I threw her my money. I think what she really wanted was my Lucky Charm necklace. Your Lucky Charm necklace? Yeah, every once in a while you can find a cap with a blue star on it. They're pretty rare, so I started collecting them. Once I had enough, I made a necklace out of them, since I thought they were lucky. We have three options. If we end the conversation and tell him to just be careful in the future, he says... I will. That's the last time I pick up a straggler on the road, believe me. And he walks off into the distance. This day just can't get any worse. If instead we pass a 50 speech check, we can say... All sorts of nasty people are looking for caps like those. You'd be safer if you got rid of them. Really? 
I had no idea. And here I've been carrying them all this time, never knowing how dangerous they were. What do you think I should do with them? Bury them or something? Well, I can hold on to them for you. I'm not worried about the people that are looking for them. They're all yours. I sincerely hope they work better for you than they did for me. And he gives us seven Sunset Sarsaparilla Star Bottle Caps. If we loot Jacqueline's corpse, sure enough, we find two Star Bottle Caps on her body. The other two options have the exact same result. We can either tell him to figure it out himself, or encourage him to just get rid of them. You got it. I'm glad I ran into you. Thanks for the advice. But of course, we always have the option to kill Thomas. When he tells us that his caps are lucky, we can say, Lucky for me, you mean. Hand them over. What? The hell I will! And of course he opens fire. If we choose this option, we not only get the caps, but on his corpse we find Thomas's journal. The only page of his journal we can read is the final page, and it says, Things finally seem to be turning around. I made a nice bundle of caps turning in some scrap in the last town I passed, and now I have a new traveling companion. Her name is Jacqueline. She's pretty cute. I'm not going to get ahead of myself here, but things are looking up. And to think, I was actually beginning to doubt the power of my lucky necklace. No, Thomas, I don't think anyone can deny the power that necklace has over people. A short time later, out of the blue, we get approached by a man named Malcolm Holmes. Hello there. It's good to see a friendly face. I almost took you for a raider, I did. Name's Malcolm. Malcolm Holmes. Don't suppose you'd care to trade. I'm missing a few essentials and... Ah, oh, screw this. Lying just ain't in my nature. I'll tell it to you straight. I've been following you for a good bit now. It started off innocently enough. I was traveling, as I often do, and happened to observe you picking up one of those blue star caps. You didn't show any reaction to it, so I figured you didn't know what you'd gotten your hands on. Wait, you've been following me? Why didn't you say anything when I looted the caps? I had to make sure of your disposition. There's a lot of jumpy folks out there that'll shoot a man as soon as talk to him. Now that we're conversing, though, I can tell you what I know about those caps. There's an old wasteland legend that says somewhere out there is a fabulous treasure from before the war. Those caps with the blue star on them, the tale goes, are the key to that treasure. They're called Sunset Sarsaparilla Stars. So you collect these yourself? Nah, I gave it up years ago. Too dangerous. And even if I did still collect them, I tell you the same. There's people out there so mad with the idea of treasure that they'll attack strangers just on the suspicion that they have some of those caps. Yeah, we just met one of them. Well, Malcolm, where can I find more of these caps? All over the place. The easiest place to find them is unopened bottles of Sunset Sarsaparilla. You'd think they'd all have been picked clean by now, but somehow new bottles keep appearing in the machines. Some say it's old Festus that does it hoping someone will finally collect enough caps to earn the treasure. Other than bottles, you'll just have to scavenge. You can find caps in the unlikeliest of places, and blue star caps are no exception. You mentioned a man named Festus. Who's he? It's said that the treasure is guarded by a man named Festus, and he's the one who asked for the blue star caps. It's also said he's been around since the war, standing a lonely vigil, waiting for someone to come and take the treasure off his hands. That'll make him pretty damn old, but I've met a few people in my travels who claim they actually met him. And they weren't the lying type, either. What kind of treasure are we talking about? No one knows. Money, weapons, water. It is, or maybe was, something of value. And that's enough to get people motivated. Thanks for the info, Malcolm. No problem. If you do end up trying to collect more stars, watch out for a man named Alan Marks. He's killed several people for their stars already. Now, he says that he doesn't Watch collect out. the stars anymore, but he sure knows a lot about them for not being a collector. If we decide to murder this man, sure enough, on his body, we find six Sunset Sarsaparilla Star Bottle Caps. If we get the caps on all three of these individuals, we can walk away with 15 stars. Now I am intrigued. I have got to collect as many stars as I can to discover this treasure. But before Malcolm left, he gave us a warning. There is a man who is so murderous that he has developed an infamous reputation related to the stars. Alan Marks. 
Malcolm told us that Alan Marks has killed several people already in search of the star bottle Come caps. On. Now we find these sunset sarsaparilla stars all over the place. There's a small chance that every bottle of sunset sarsaparilla that we find has a star bottle cap on it. So just by drinking sunset sarsaparilla, we can gain star bottle caps. But these star bottle caps are also found lying about in many of the dungeons that we visit. But we have to collect 50 of these things, which can take quite some time. In fact, I recorded this footage many months ago when I first started making videos about Fallout New Vegas. And all this time between then and now, I've been collecting Sunset Sarsaparilla Star Bottle Caps. But at last, I finally have 50. But now we need to find the treasure. Malcolm told us that it was guarded by an immortal man named Festus. Where can we find him? Well, our best bet is to head on over to the Sunset Sarsaparilla factory. We find this factory along the road to New Vegas. It's amongst the ruins of South Vegas. The sign on the outside says, Sunset Sarsaparilla, established 1918. It has a big bottle standing outside the front door, making it impossible to miss. Going around the building, we find a small raider camp just off in the distance, and then a gated off picnic area where the workers must have gone to eat their lunches. Here we find a door to the factory floor, but we won't go in this way. As we continue exploring around, we find another door to the factory floor on the northern side of the building, and just outside we find all sorts of crates some of which still have unopened bottles of Sunset Sarsaparilla. There are delivery trucks nearby, most of which are empty. And finally, we come around the corner back to the eastern side of the building and walk through the giant bottle to enter the building through the front door. This brings us to the building's lobby. On the wall to the right is a poster. The most popular beverage in the West, Sunset Sarsaparilla made with pure cane sugar. We hear robots off in the distance, but exploring a nearby door, we find it completely blocked up. We'll have to find another way deeper in. And against the southern wall, right in this lobby, we find an animatronic robot cowboy man named Festus. Is this the very same Festus that Malcolm told us about? Howdy, partner. Welcome to the headquarters of the Sunset Sarsaparilla Company. Ring the local stool and listen to old Festus jaw. Pleased to meet you, Festus. New in town, partner? Well, let old Festus give you the lay of the land. If you're here to redeem your sunset sarsaparilla stars, dump them into the slot in the barrel below and I'll count them up. If you don't know what sunset sarsaparilla stars are and think old Festus is just shooting his mouth off, say star info. If you're here to challenge old Festus to a game of lucky horseshoes, say, I feel lucky. Lastly, if you're here about the health advisory that aired on Channel 6 recently, say, silly old advisory. Oh my, lots of options. Let's choose Star Info to learn more. Oh, new to the hunt, are you? Well, listen carefully, as old Festus don't like to repeat himself. Select Sunset Sarsaparilla bottles will have special caps with blue stars on them. These caps are known as Sunset Sarsaparilla Stars. Why are these stars there, and what do they mean? <laughs> Nobody knows, except maybe old Festus. <laughs> Rustle up enough of them and you can win a prize. So get out there and start drinking Sunset Sarsaparilla. Well, we have our 50 caps, but before we deposit them into this animatronic cowboy, let's see if he has anything more to say. He mentioned something about a health advisory. When we ask him about it... I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that. Could you repeat it? So we ask him again. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that. Could you repeat it? And then we have to ask him a third time. While Sunset Sarsaparilla is perfectly safe, a recent independent study, whose validity is currently being challenged, revealed the following. Excessive ingestion of sarsaparilla can lead to deleterious effects, including, but not limited to, kidney damage, nausea, digital numbness, anxiety, loss of visual acuity, dizziness, occasional nosebleeds, Joint inflammation, tooth decay, sore throat, bronchitis, organ rupture, and halitosis. Note that you'd have to 
drink a heap of Sunset Sarsaparilla to match the quantities used in the study. <laughs> How much, you ask? A lot. A whole hell of a lot. In fact, you'd have to get full as a tick on Sunset Sarsaparilla to even come close. Anyway, thanks for stopping by, partner. And keep drinking Sunset Sarsaparilla. So Sunset Sarsaparilla can kill ya! Well, I suppose that's good to know that the news has come late. I've drunk at least 50 of these doggone things. Now Festus can also play a card game with us. If we choose the option that says, I feel lucky, he tells us about a game he can play called Lucky Horseshoes. When we ask him how to play, he says, Lucky Horseshoes is played with cards number 2 through 10 and aces, which have a value of 1. He then goes on to explain the rules in great detail, but it's basically just a game of 21 with a simple twist. If we play the game with him, he then just tells us which card we drew. The closest to 21 without going over wins, but if we win, we get a random reward. Yeah, looks like you win, partner. Old Festus just couldn't match those keen skills of yours. Here's your reward. Sometimes it's a random card that we can use in building our caravan deck, and sometimes it's a Sunset Sarsaparilla star bottle cap. At any rate, our final option is to deposit our 50 Sunset Sarsaparilla stars into the slot. Woohoo! You did it, partner! Bullet for you! Old Festus knew you could do it. I suppose you'll be wanting that prize now. Well then, hold on to your hat, cause it's a doozy. Not many people have heard the true story behind Sunset Sarsaparilla. Well, it's a right honor. And now, without further ado, your prize, the Legend of the Star. Long ago, people didn't have a heap of choices when it came to soft drinks. It was either water or Nuka-Cola. Now, the threat of legal action forces me to say that Nuka-Cola is a swell beverage, but sometimes people just wanted something different, you know? So one day, a man, a saloon owner in a small town, decided to make a new type of soft drink and asked his patrons what flavor they'd like it to be. After getting no help from them, a stranger at the end of the bar suggested the man make a sarsaparilla-flavored drink. The stranger said he would happily share his family's recipe for the drink on one condition. The condition being that the stranger would be allowed to sample a bottle whenever he liked to ensure the recipe was being followed to the letter. The man happily agreed, thinking the drink would make him rich and the stranger promised to meet him by sundown the next day. The next morning, the sheriff stopped by and reported that the stranger's body was found on the side of the town road. He'd been killed by bandits. The man, cursing his luck, closed the saloon early that day, just as the sun began to set. But after he'd locked the doors, he turned around to find an unfamiliar bottle on the bar with a note beneath it. The note was sealed with blue wax in the shape of a star. Opening it, the man found it contained a recipe for a sarsaparilla-flavored drink. Sampling the bottle's contents and finding it singularly delicious, the man gave silent thanks to his mysterious benefactor, wherever he was. Being an honorable man, the saloon owner paid for the stranger's funeral, thinking it was the least he could do to repay him. The saloon owner went on to become rich selling the new drink, and to this day, some bottles of Sunset Sarsaparilla have a blue star under their caps. Some say the saloon owner ordered it done in honor of the stranger. Others say it's the stranger sampling the bottles like he promised. And that's the legend of the store. Hope you enjoyed it, and hope you continue enjoying Sunset Sarsaparilla. That was our prize, 
To hear a story about the history of Sunset Sarsaparilla? Is this some kind of joke? The Sunset Sarsaparilla Company has received a number of complaints regarding the prize awarded for handing in Sunset Sarsaparilla stars. Therefore, we have seen fit to provide another prize that we feel will placate the most discriminating customer. Just head through the double doors and follow the hallway to your left to the very end. An attendant will be there to present your prize directly. We at the Sunset Sarsaparilla Company would once again like to thank you for your patronage. With that, we finish the quest, The Legend of the Star, and we get the quest, A Valuable Lesson. And I wonder what lesson we will learn. We then have to weave our way through this factory to find the prize. As we explore, we come upon some Sunset Sarsaparilla security robots. These are always hostile. We also find broken robots. This tells us that scavengers or raiders have been here before. Now, there are a few things that don't add up with Festus's story here. For one, the company's established date, which we see on all of the signs here in the Sunset Sarsaparilla headquarters, say 1918. This would make the Sunset Sarsaparilla Company 63 years older than the Nuka Cola Company, which we know from Fallout lore was founded in 2044. We learned this date from Sierra Petrovita, whom we met in Fallout 3. This date was also re-established a number of times while exploring Nuka World in Fallout 4. But the problem is that Festus tells us that before Sunset Sarsaparilla was created, Nuka Cola existed. Remember, he said that all there was to drink was water and Nuka Cola, which is impossible. Nuka Cola did not exist in 1918. This leaves us with three options. The first is that all of the signs outside the building are wrong and that the real founding date for Sunset Sarsaparilla was much later in time. The second is that Festus is lying. His story is just made up. And the third is that Obsidian simply got the lore wrong, which wouldn't be the first time. After all, remember, they placed Mr. Handy robots, which are made by General Atomics, in the Repcon facility, which is owned by Robco not General Atomics. At any rate, I think the second option, that Festus is just weaving us a big yarn, is likely the correct one, because the story is dark and has some interesting quirks. I think this entire story is a fabricated lie to add a sense of mystery and intrigue to the Sunset Sarsaparilla brand. If anything, the bartender killed the man who had the recipe so that he wouldn't have to give the man free drinks for the rest of his life. But the likely truth is that the Sunset Sarsaparilla Company likely developed the recipe by themselves, and maybe they cheated an inventor or an alchemist here or there to get a winning recipe. But I doubt very much in this fantasy that we hear from Festus. Now, Festus gave us instructions to go through the big double doors to get our prize. Having gone through them, we found a dead end. We found a door that led back outside. This was one of the factory floor doors that we saw earlier. But the way left that he told us to go has since been filled in by rubble. But along the way, we've discovered big glowing ash piles, which tells us that someone has been here before. This person was responsible for these ash piles and for destroying some of the other robots. This leaves our only option to go north from the lobby entrance and down the hallway. In one of the rooms, we find a big broken Mr. Handy robot called Mr. Janitor. He's not dead, we can't loot his body, but we can't interact with him in any way. Nearby, there is a desk with a terminal. On the desk is a folder with the Sunset Sarsaparilla logo on it. But what's strange about this folder is if you zoom in, the folder is labeled Brotherhood of Steel History Files. I've looked at all of the folders in this Sunset Sarsaparilla headquarters, and they all say Brotherhood of Steel history files. I think this may be a bug. I think Obsidian is reusing assets from Fallout 3, slapped a Sunset Sarsaparilla logo on top of them, but forgot to remove the label that said Brotherhood of Steel history. That's the only way I can explain this. The nearby terminal is locked with an average lock, but if we unlock it, we learn that it is the Sunset Sarsaparilla custodial control. Our first option is to check mail, and we learn about a water leak. The vice president of operations, Clark Weathers, sent a company-wide intramail talking about the water leak. He says that he's gotten reports that there was a small water leak in one of the upstairs meeting rooms. He 
notes that the damage of long-term water exposure can be extremely expensive to repair, so he wants the custodial staff to get on this and fix it before it gets any worse. The next message, great job, comes from none other than Kenneth Aguilar, the president of Sunset Sarsaparilla. He's congratulating this custodian on the success of his janitor robots. It looks like this company replaced most of their janitorial staff with the Mr. Handy robots. In particular, robot number 135 has been very popular with the staff. They just love seeing these Mr. Handys flying around, speaking in that quirky British accent. The robots have been keeping the place clean. One of the big complaints before was stray bottle caps getting into the machinery. He ends by saying, we need to talk about what we are going to do with the rest of your staff. Let's talk Tuesday. Well, I get the idea that there are going to be some big layoffs in the future. This is what happens when human labor is replaced with machine labor. The final option option is to check the maintenance system. This system is connected to all of the Mr. Handy janitor robots. Most of the Mr. Handys are unavailable, but Handy Robot 135, the very same one that the president said was a staff favorite, is in standby mode. From this terminal, we can click a button to activate him, and when we do, the Mr. Handy jumps up. I see my services are required once more. It's about time. He then flies off to go clean up bottle caps from around the factory. Oh my. This place is filthy! If we follow him, he runs right through an office room and into a bottling room. It's amazing how much dust collects if you leave things alone even for a short while. Inside this bottling room, we find a few more Mr. Handys still functional. Heading inside, we can talk with one of these Mr. Handys. Worker number 27438 reporting! There seems to be a malfunction with the light, sir! Wait a minute! You're not my manager! Intruder! And the Mr. Handy opens fire. We sadly have to destroy this robot. Next to the working Mr. Handys are some conveyor belts, where presumably the bottles would enter this room and then the Mr. Handys would box them up, and then the Sunset Sarsaparilla shipping crates. Inside the crates, we find empty bottles and full bottles of Sunset Sarsaparilla. It can get overwhelming, but you can loot each and every one of these crates, and if you do, you're gonna walk away with 83 bottles of Sunset Sarsaparilla. At least, that's how many I walked away with. There are also lots of bottle caps on the floor, so keep an eye out for them. Free money is free money. There's a stairway against the southern wall. This brings us to a loft area where we find even more of these crates. After the janitor robot is done cleaning this room... Really? Someone should have called me earlier. He leaves at a lightning pace. If we follow him around the corner, he leads us to a big loading bay. This room is even worse than the last one. Warning, continued operation cannot be guaranteed. This room is protected by hostile protectrons, so we have to get rid of them. What have you savages been doing here? Here we find even more crates filled with Sunset Sarsaparilla and empty bottles. In the middle of the room, right next to a big stack of Sunset Sarsaparilla, we find a bottle cap press. Before the war, the Sunset Sarsaparilla Company used this press to create the bottle caps they would then put on the bottles. But after the war, we learn from the Crimson Caravan Company that scavengers have been using this press to forge new bottle caps. This, of course, devalues the currency. One of the things that's valuable about bottle caps is there's a finite number of them. No new bottle caps are being made, which means that once somebody has collected all of them, that person owns all of the wealth. So the Crimson Caravan Company sends us here to disable this press so that no one can print any more bottle caps. That helps maintain the value of caps as currency and helps maintain a stable economy. On a nearby desk, we find an average locked terminal. Inside we find one saved message and one draft. The saved message was from the owner of this terminal to Margie Walker, the truckers union rep. Subject, bad news. Now we already learned from the previous terminal that the president of this company has hired robots to replace all of the janitors. But it sounds like they were doing the same thing for some of the Sunset Sarsaparilla delivery drivers. In this terminal, we find a message from the owner of this terminal, who is presumably the man in charge of this loading bay, and it's a message to Margie Walker, the trucker's union representative. He says that the president just ordered some sort of newfangled robot that is supposed 
supposed to take over some of her deliveries. Now, he's not supposed to be talking about it, but as the union rep, she'll be hearing about it soon anyway. The next entry is a draft. It was never actually sent, but it's labeled Worse News. He was going to send this to Margie. He says, we've got trouble. You know that Hush Hush experimental robot I told you about the other day? It has single-handedly been running all of our distribution in the Vegas area. Your boys are not on temporary leave. It's permanent. Hold on, the president wants to see me in his office. I'll finish this later. Well, it's likely that the president fired this man, seeing as how this message is a draft and was never sent. Now, this is a little confusing because in both messages, he's referring to one robot. He doesn't say robots. He says robot singular, and he describes it as a newfangled robot. Well, the only unique newfangled robot we find in this building is Festus himself. But we see Festus in the front lobby, and Festus seems like more of a marketing robot. He interfaces with consumers, tells them stories, plays games with them, and helps them turn in their bottle caps. He's not a truck driver. And those are the people who lost their jobs. He says the boss ordered a newfangled robot to take over some of your deliveries. Festus doesn't deliver Sunset Sarsaparilla, so is he talking about a different robot? Is this a robot that we're gonna meet later, or is it a robot that was cut? Could he instead be talking about the Protectrons we saw here? Possibly, but if so, why did he use Robot Singular instead of Robots Plural? And I didn't know Protectrons could drive. I could understand if they were just loading bay workers, but he's talking about truck drivers here, doing deliveries. Maybe we'll find the answer as we explore further. At any rate, the company had already replaced their janitorial staff with Mr. Handys. We don't find any human remains inside this loading bay. It's likely that they replaced their loading staff with Protectrons. It only makes sense that they would then replace all of their delivery drivers with some other kind of robot. Because after all, humans can unionize. Humans can complain of low wages. It only makes sense that they would replace those humans with robots. Robots who can't unionize. Robots who never complain about low wages. After the janitorial robot cleans up all of the caps in the loading bay, he zips on out of the room and heads down the hallway. He passes a door to his left. If we turn in to explore, we find a company break room. There's not much notable in here, except there's still a fresh apple on a table. It says fresh apple. It not only looks fresh, but it says fresh. Either these apples have been injected with so many chemicals that they can last 200 years in this office, or somebody's been here recently and left this fresh apple. What I like about this break room is all of the art on the walls. You can tell that this was a gentleman's business. There's a magazine advertisement on the poster board, which came from For Him magazine. We see a woman in either lingerie or a swimsuit playing hula hoop. Gotta love those legs and hips. And apparently this woman's name was Leggy Lovely Lucy Luckhurst. <laughs> Gotta love the alliteration there, guys. We find some booze in the fridge, and then on the next wall, we find some artwork promoting fallout shelters. Here's a turtle next to a bomb saying, Oh my danger! The turtle ducks into its shell just before the bomb explodes. Boom! Kids, learn to find shelter. I love seeing examples of pre-war propaganda. It helps better understand the paranoia of that world. But the janitor robot, of course, skips this by. He goes down the hallway around the corner and heads right to a trash can next to a Sunset Sarsaparilla marketing poster. He dumps something inside and then goes back into the custodial closet and shuts down. Heading back over to the garbage can that the robot dumped something into, we find a big stack of 553 bottle caps. This robot went around and swept up all of the bottle caps in the place and dumped them right here for us to loot. Thanks, number 135. Heading back into the office cubicles, we can loot caps from the desks and closets, but we also find a working terminal hiding behind an upright desk. This terminal has the annual sales report. We'll learn a little bit about who's actually drinking Sunset Sarsaparilla. The company's been having improved performance to the east thanks to their recent marketing campaign called 
build mass with SAS. The Northeast continued to be a tough nut to crack, where they've had slower than expected growth. But things have been shaping up in the North and Midwest, and the Southwest maintains their strongest sales to date. This year has been better than the recent years, and the writer of this note wants everyone to feel proud of themselves. Right next to this, we find a big poster breaking down their sales in both a pie chart and a bar graph. Here we see that the Southwest accounts for nearly 30% of their total sales. The North to Midwest each account for less than 25%. Fourth place is Canada. Remember in the Fallout world, Canada had recently been annexed. And bringing up the rear is the Northeast. Now the floor above has collapsed, forming a ramp to the second floor. We remember from the custodian terminal that there was a water leak on the second floor. Perhaps this can account for the collapse ceiling. Maybe the water damage caused the wood to rot, which led to this collapse. Heading on up, we find ourselves in a marketing room. Lots of marketing posters on the floor, including one with the Build Mass with SAS marketing campaign. Looks like they were trying to convince people that Sunset Sarsaparilla would make you physically stronger. Right, because that's what sugar does. Perplexing to me is against the northern wall we find a sign that says, Notice out of order. What? What is out of order? The wall? Is the wall out of order? There's no vending machine, no elevator, no light. There's nothing electrical against this wall. Why is this out of order sign against a wall? I don't have an answer. I just found it to be very strange. Turning around, we see a hallway split in two. We have two paths. Heading down the path in front of us, we see a doorway that leads to the loft area overlooking the packing room. And in the hallway, a broken custodial robot. We come to a T-junction here. The right path is completely blocked off. We see a stairway leading down. At the end, we see a blocked doorway to the right and to the left, a very hard locked door. Putting on some overalls and using a magazine, I was able to unlock this door. Inside we find an office. Here we learn that this terminal belonged to Mr. Brody. We learned from another terminal that Mr. Brody is Marcus Brody, the VP of Technology. But all we find on this terminal are automated messages. The terminal is connected to the Mr. Handys and Protectrons that we found here, and a new message is generated based on the status that these robots observe. Most of the earlier messages are fairly normal, reporting things like inactivity or whether or not one of the robots needs repair. But what's interesting is when we reach the third page, we see that the robots have detected an intruder. And then we start seeing messages saying, report, major structural damage, report, intruder has been injured. We see long periods of reported inactivity before we see the reports about the intruder. So what I gather is what we already know, that the bombs fell, all of the people here died, but the robots remained active. Without orders, they remained inactive for 200 years until recently, an intruder broke into the facility and started shooting up all the robots, which is why we found so many destroyed protectrons when we arrived. Looks like most of the manual labor aspects of this company were now being managed by robots, which in turn were being operated by Mr. Brody from this terminal. Heading back up the stairs, we can explore a couple of bathrooms, a couple more office rooms, until at last we come to a room with a big hole on the floor. This room has a very easy locked terminal. The terminal belonged to Miss Page, whom we can presume was the president's secretary. There are two messages saved in the inbox. The first is, what contest? And it's here that we learn that the idea that the star bottle caps could be redeemed for a prize was just a rumor. This message came from Nathan Stanley, the director of public relations. If anybody knew whether or not there was an actual contest going on here, it would be the PR guy. But he says that he doesn't know about any contest. He sends a message to the president saying, what contest? Sir, what do you want me to do about these rumors? Should I release a statement denouncing the rumors? So some of the bottle caps just had a star on them. They weren't part of any contest, but people began collecting them thinking that they they were. The next note, how do you like your toy, comes from Lucas Nash, the VP of sales at Robco. Lucas says, Kenneth, I hope you're impressed with your recent purchase. Contact me if you have any questions. What purchase is he talking about? This is Robco. Did Kenneth recently purchase a robot? Checking the saved messages, we find a response from the president to Nathan. He says, Stanley, are you out of your mind? Have you seen the latest sales figures? We're up 300% since these rumors started. And you're asking if you want me to make it stop? Please stop by my office so we can further discuss 
address the issue. Next, he has a message to Marcus Brody, his VP of Technology, whose office we found downstairs on the first floor earlier. He says, Marcus, I have a few ideas on how we can turn this whole contest rumor situation to our advantage. He's got an idea for a very special project, and he wants to work with Marcus and the advertising guys to get it done. He ends by saying, by the way, how do you feel about cowboys? The final message is a response to Lucas Nash, the Robco sales guy, about his new toy. In this message, the president says, Lucas, I couldn't be happier with the performance of the new model. He says, if its current performance is any measure, it promises to reinvent my company's entire distribution network. I'd like to tentatively discuss purchasing a few more in the near future. How soon do you expect more to become available? So, from this terminal, we learn a couple of important things. The first thing we learn is that this entire contest was a complete accident. People saw the stars on the bottle caps and just thought that by collecting them, they would get something special. The rumors began to spread, people began to believe it, and the president seized this opportunity to turn it into a marketing ploy. He got the idea for a talking cowboy and then approached Robco to create Festus, the animatronic cowboy that he placed in the lobby of the Las Vegas bottling plant. He was just testing out this robot, but the results were great, and so he was planning on working with Robco to create more of these robots and send them to the other Sunset Sarsaparilla bottling plants around the nation. But since the bombs dropped, he never had the opportunity, leaving Festus the only one of its kind. However, what doesn't make sense is how Festus would take the jobs of the loading bay workers and truck drivers. Remember in the loading bay, we saw that terminal where the guy was talking with the truck driving union rep? saying that the newfangled robot aka Festus, was single-handedly taking over all of the company's distribution, which means that the temporary leave that the workers had been placed on was now permanent. And then here, even in this terminal, the president says, this robot is going to completely reinvent my distribution network. But what I don't understand is how Festus could possibly do that. Festus is an animatronic robot in a box. He doesn't have legs, he doesn't even have wheels, he can't move. How does he take over a company's distribution network? How does he single-handedly do the work of a bunch of human truck drivers and loading bay workers? All he does is interface with customers who are trying to redeem their star bottle caps for a reward. This is just a promotional marketing robot, not a distribution marketing robot. It doesn't solve any problems with distribution, that is, figuring out how to get the Sunset Sarsaparilla bottle to where the consumer wants to consume it. So I'm not sure how Festus took their jobs. At any rate, we can loot plenty of Sunset Sarsaparilla from the vending machine and fridge in this room, and we can unlock a safe on the wall that's got pre-war money and one Sunset Sarsaparilla star bottle cap. Jumping down into the hole, we find a number of tool cabinets, which have randomized loot inside, and then heading through the double doors, we finally find ourselves at the other end of that rubble pile that was blocking our way earlier. This means that the double doors we see here must lead to the real prize. Opening the door, we see a bunch of sheriff badges all over the floor. When we loot one and check it out in our Pip-Boy, it has no weight and no value. The badge simply says, Sunset Sarsaparilla Deputy. Is this the prize? After turning in 50 bottle caps, do we only get this flimsy deputy badge? In the corner of the room, we find a corpse lying against the wall. As we get closer, we see that this corpse belongs to Alan Marks. Alan Marks. That's the name of the man whom Malcolm warned us about when he first told us about Festus and the legend. Alan Marks is the one who became infamous for murdering all of those people searching for star bottle caps. And here he lies in this room surrounded by deputy badges, dead. On the ground near his body is a holotape labeled Alan Marks's Last Words. Looting this holotape completes the quest and we get the achievement the legend of the star. We can then open the holotape in our Pip-Boy to hear Alan's last words. I guess this is it. Not much air left now. Minutes, maybe. And this is what I have to show for it. I guess the joke's on me. Probably shouldn't have killed all those people. Probably should have stayed at home and taken care of my mom. She always used to say people who murder and steal die bad in the end. Said they... 
Elon Marx somehow got trapped in this room. We saw a lock on the door. The door was unlocked when we arrived, but maybe it had been unlocked since he died in here. He got locked in this room and he ran out of air and he began to suffocate to death. But we find blood on the wall behind his head and blood by his hand near his laser pistol. This tells us that instead of suffocating to death, he chose the short way out. He chose to end his life instead of suffer through that agony. The weapon near his hand is unique. It's a laser pistol called Pew Pew. It's a pretty decent gun with 47 damage and a DPS of 123. This weapon does way more damage than any other laser pistol, but it also costs more ammunition, consuming five energy cells per shot. But it's also a holdout weapon, which means you can sneak it into casinos. It also has a completely unique look. Alan Marks must have been obsessed with Sunset Sarsaparilla. He outfitted this weapon with the gold and amber colors of the Sunset Sarsaparilla company. We also find a bottle cap attached to the back of a gun with a star crudely drawn on on it, and he's etched his kills into the weapon. If you count them up, there are a total of 23 tallies etched into this gun, meaning that Alan Marks has murdered 23 people for their bottle caps. The look of the laser itself is different too. This laser is orange, like a bottle of Sunset Sarsaparilla instead of the typical red. Besides the gun, I was a little underwhelmed about the loot we get until I inspected each of these crates. I was expecting more Sunset Sarsaparilla, but instead each of these crates has a stash of bottle caps. Each one has well over a hundred bottle caps. Looting each of the crates netted me well over 1,000 bottle caps. If you loot all the bottle caps you find on the factory floor and you get the caps that the janitor robot placed in the trash can, you can walk away with well over 1,500 bottle caps. As we leave, we can try to talk to Festus again, but he's non-functional. Once you complete this quest, Festus powers down forever. And that's all we hear about the Sunset Sarsaparilla Company until we install Nuka World for Fallout 4. We learn from the Nuka World expansion that the Nuka Cola Company came out with a new flavor of Nuka Cola in direct response to the success of Sunset Sarsaparilla. They tried to buy out the Sunset Sarsaparilla Company but failed, and their response was to come out with Nuka Cola Wild, a root beer flavored version of Nuka Cola. And once we install the Honest Hearts DLC, we have the option to craft a homebrewed version of Sunset Sarsaparilla. The recipe is one Nevada agave fruit and one Xander root. Again, hinting at the root beer flavor of the Sunset Sarsaparilla. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full story of Sunset Sarsaparilla in Fallout New Vegas. It's a theme of greed. A theme that has been explored elsewhere in the Fallout franchise. It was explored in depth in the Dead Money DLC. And this entire experience is very reminiscent of the Treasure of Jamaica Plain from Fallout 4. The allure of treasure is just too much for some people to withstand. And this greed leads them to do unthinkable acts of violence. Alan murdered 23 people in his quest for Festus's treasure chest, and it was only once he discovered that there was no reward that he felt any lick of remorse. It sounds like he was raised right, though. His mother taught him what happens to violent men. His mother taught him what greed can do to your soul. And yet he let it overcome him anyway. He let it rule his life. He let it become an obsession. An obsession that not only brought him to murder, but also caused him to ignore his dying mother. We can assume she died alone, having not seen her son for a very long time. But maybe we can take comfort in the thought that his mother never knew that her son would turn out to be the very kind of murderer she tried to warn him about. At least she died blissfully ignorant of that fact. What, ladies and gentlemen, are your thoughts about The Legend of the Star Quest and the Sunset Sarsaparilla Company? Were you satisfied with the rewards of this quest? Or did you feel like Pew Pew and around 1,500 caps were not worth the 50-star bottle caps you spent so long trying to collect? Let me know in the comments section below. I read all of your comments and I use your comments as inspiration for my future videos. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week, spanning the entire Fallout franchise. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next Fallout video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I've got a t-shirt shop, folks. If you would like an Oxhorn or Fallout-themed t-shirt, you can find a link to my shop in the description below. 
And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.